Well, good morning and happy Easter to you. Thank you so much for being here with us at Crossway Church this morning. Whether you are a regular attender, a member here, or you're a first-time watcher, we're thankful to have you. I'm sorry that you cannot be here and we can't gather together and worship. It's a very different Easter, but we're glad to be able to come to you there in your living room, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to sing a couple songs this morning. I hope that you'll engage in the service. The words will be on the screen. Sing along with us this morning. Living John. 
this time in our service, we give our uh, church members, our church family, an opportunity to give. If you are visiting with us, there's no pressure here at all. We don't expect any money. Uh, but for our church family, you've been so faithful to meet the needs and financial needs of the church. We're very thankful for that. On your screen there, there's three options for you to give. If you'd like to continue to do so, you can mail your check-in. You can give online through a link, or you can text to give as well. And I just want to praise our Crossway Church family for the way that they've been so faithful in this way. Let's pray, ask the Lord to continue to take care of our church family individually and our church corporately during this time. Father, thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your provision. Thank you that uh, this is your church, Lord, and we are your people. And uh, we can rest in you and your ability and desire to provide for us. Lord, I ask you bless our church financially. Lord, I ask that you bless our church family financially. Sustain us during this time. Thank you for all the ways you've blessed us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Thank you so much for that, Chris. I hope you enjoyed that there at home. And if you have a Bible, join us in the book of Matthew again in chapter number 28 as we're continuing and finishing today our series called Greater Love. And we remember last week we talked about uh, the two disciples of Jesus Christ in Judas and Peter who both were really at the end of the day guilty of the same thing. They both in the same evening uh, denied Christ or betrayed Christ. Judas, you know, sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Peter three different times denied knowing him just hours after telling him he would die if he had to, to be there uh, with Jesus Christ. But the end of their stories were incredibly different. You see that Judas walks away uh, feeling this, this, uh, this sorrow inside, but he does not repent to Christ. Peter, if you remember, repents from something to someone and is used in the future to do incredible things for the gospel of Jesus Christ, including preaching at Pentecost, uh, being part of the early church, writing portions of scripture. And uh, what we took last week was that your failure and my failure does not have to be the end of our story. It does not have to define us. And because of the cross of Jesus Christ, we know that we serve a God of second and third and fourth and fifth chances and I, for one, am very thankful for that. We're going to continue the story. I want to look very quickly this morning at chapter number 28 of the book of Matthew. We're going to read the first seven verses. And uh, we're just going to spend some time this morning on Resurrection Sunday, remembering the sacrifice of Calvary. The Bible says in, in chapter number 28, book of Matthew, verse number one, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. 
And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Verse number five. And the angel answered and said unto the women, both of the Marys there, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Look with me here at verse number six. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told, told you. I love this portion of scripture. I like in my mind to imagine being there at the garden tomb when this took place as, as the women came, no doubt, uh, eyes swollen from time, crying and, and weeping at, at, uh, uh, at the loss of, of Christ and seeing that stone uh, has been moved and the angel there. But the meaning of this passage is so much greater when you consider what happened just a few days before. We finished last week talking about Judas there in the Garden of Gethsemane betraying Jesus Christ. And I want to uh, kind of tie together here as you remember, Jesus has been there praying in the garden and Judas comes with an army of people, an army of angry men with him. They've got swords and torches and they're there. And, and remember, Judas comes and gives Jesus a kiss on the cheek and, and Jesus turns and says, uh, what do you need, friend? And, and he's, he's taken quickly. And that's kind of where we ended last week. I want to just continue the story here of Jesus Christ as we talk about the reason he was born. The song that Chris just sang makes a good point. It says the beginning of the story. I love Christmas time. The beginning of the story is, is wonderful and it's great. But the part of the story we talk about today is what saves souls. The part that we talk about today is what changes lives. The fact that Jesus Christ, born in a manger, was here for a purpose and a mission. And it was to die on the cross for the sins of man. You see, this was the plan before the foundation of the world. As Jesus is arrested there, Judas has betrayed him. I want to look uh, together this morning at the suffering of the cross. And you'll see this contained in all of the gospel accounts. But Jesus is taken before a group of Jewish religious leaders at the time. They arrested our Savior and, and took him before Annas. And then later, a guy by the name of Caiaphas. And they had this group called the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was a, a religious board that was, that was kind of uh, making decisions at the time. They bring him there and they accuse Jesus of blasphemy. They say this man is, is a blasphemer. He calls himself the son of God. There are 14 different illegalities that take place during the trial of Jesus Christ. The Sanhedrin there uh, decides that he is guilty. By the way, they'd been conspiring together all along from the beginning anyway. It was the plan. I, I, I look at this and I see uh, nothing here is catching Jesus Christ by surprise. Nothing is even catching the Sanhedrin by surprise. They've wanted Christ and his blood all along because he threatens their system, you know. And, and by the way, Jesus Christ kind of threatens and rocks our world and our way of thinking when he comes in. That's why I think people are often so apprehensive to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they bring him before the Sanhedrin and they declare him guilty. Now, the Sanhedrin would have liked to have put Jesus Christ to death. There's a couple of problems here. Number one, the Jewish way of, of executing an individual was by stoning, right? And we know the Old Testament prophesied that Jesus would die by crucifixion. The Bible says, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So look at the way that God has pieced all of this together. They're all here at the time of the Passover and they bring Jesus, the Sanhedrin gets together at an illegal time when they could not even be together and, and determine that Jesus needs to be put to death, but they've got to get clever about how to do it. Right, Because at the time, the Romans are in charge. And so listen, the Romans have stepped in and said, hey, we want to be the people who are, who are taking care of these major crimes, the, the issues of, of capital punishment and, and putting somebody to death. So we're going to take that right away from the Sanhedrin. Now, if you've read your Bible, you understand that that did not stop the, the Jews from stoning other people. You know, people like Stephen and, and times in the early church, individuals were stoned. The Pharisees wanted to stone a woman 
even before this time. The problem was this was the time of the Passover. And at the time of the Passover, thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews would travel back to Jerusalem to celebrate this time. And in knowing that, the Roman government says there's a lot more people in Jerusalem at the time. There's a lot more likelihood for crime and, and things to take place. So they would send uh, the governor of the area to town with some soldiers at that time. That is why you see the next man in the story, a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. Pilate would not typically be spending time in Jerusalem. In fact, where Pilate's office most likely was historically was sitting kind of by the, the seas there watching the waves out. I mean, he had a good job. He had a good gig. And you can tell that when Jesus is brought before Pilate, Pilate's kind of like, oh, why, am I, why am I dealing with this? But the Jews understood at the time, we, if we want to finally end this Jesus character, we've got to get him before the Romans and charge him with something they won't like. So they went before Pilate. And they didn't charge him with blasphemy this time. They charged him with treason. The Bible says that they accused him of not paying taxes. They accused him of wanting to overthrow the government. And then they accused him of calling himself a king. Now listen, this is a no-no for the Romans. The Romans are in charge. They, they, they are the ones who are making the decisions. Nobody better dare call themselves a king. You remember the story? They bring uh, Jesus before Pilate, and Pilate is there kind of a, a torn man. His wife, in fact, tells him, don't have anything to do with this just man. Let him go. There's nothing wrong here. So Pilate, nervous, has a, a crowd gathering that, that wants something to happen to Jesus. By the way, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, guilty of Nothing. Pilate sends Jesus over to Herod in Galilee. This is his jurisdiction. Jesus now has been arrested, brought before Annas, brought before Caiaphas, before the, the Sanhedrin. He's being to took different places, brought before Pilate. Pilate sends him to Herod, and Herod expects some miracles and magic tricks. Herod Herod kind of mocks our Savior. He mocks Jesus and says, hey, hey, I've heard about you and the things you can do and the miracles you can perform. Show me something. Entertain us. Let's, let's see something incredible. The Bible records that Jesus says nothing to Herod. Herod grows impatient, sends him back to Pilate. He's back before Pilate. I'm sure Pilate somewhat, is somewhat agitated. He has Jesus in front of him, and a crowd has really shown up this time. Pilate says no less than three times that he can find no fault in Jesus Christ. To which I say, duh. Pilate could have looked for years and years and never found a single problem with Jesus Christ. He stands there and, and the crowd then uh, begins to chant things like, crucify him. Now, the Romans have, have perfected uh, some, some dark things of, of torment and murder. The Romans are the people who Paul is writing to in the book of Romans where he says, who shall deliver me from this body of death, referencing the the disgusting thing that the Romans would do where if you were found guilty of murder, they would chain you in a cell to a dead body, a, a corpse, and let that body rot while it's attached to you. And, and, and you have to walk and, and sit with, with the smell and, and the decomposition of that body as, as the maggots would begin to eat your flesh and you would slowly die that way. But I think there is no more horrific way to die than Roman crucifixion. The crowd begins to kind of, uh, it's still growing in size. It's certainly growing in volume. Pilate stands there and says, I can't find anything wrong with this man. And they're shouting things like, we don't care, just crucify him. Pilate says, I cannot crucify him unless I let somebody else go. He brings up a man that the Bible calls notable, a, a famous criminal by the name of Barabbas. By the way, this is where you and I enter the story. This criminal murderous man by the name of Barabbas is, is known around town as, as the worst guy. There's nothing so bad that Barabbas would not do. And the crowd stands up and shouts, 
Then give us Barabbas. Let Barabbas go free and let the perfect man die in his place. By the way, whether you are a believer and you've accepted Christ, uh, whether this is the first time you've ever heard this story, Barabbas represents every one of us, you and I, the guilty, filthy, deserving of punishment who is able to go free and Jesus Christ steps in and takes our place. They then take Jesus and begin the process. Jesus quiet, holding his peace the entire time. Is, is, is taken, no doubt, by force. And a beating begins. Now there are two different kinds of ideas when it comes to the whipping at the time. Some would say that they would take maybe a stump or, or a boulder and stretch the individual out over the stump or the boulder. Others would say that they would have a, a maybe a, a cross beam or a low ceiling where they would grab somebody's hands and tie them to where their, their toes would just barely touch the ground. Regardless, the idea was to stretch the body as much as possible. Then they would take what is called a cat of nine tails, which you may have heard of. They would take this whip that would have leather strips coming out of it, and in the leather strips would be things like bone and, and rock and, and glass, and they would take that back and whip it around the body of the usually a criminal, in this case, Jesus Christ, and the force would then wrap those around your body and, and latch in. The, the bone and the rock would come in and, and it would grab the flesh and they would take and rip it back as it would fillet the, the torso of the person being whipped. Every whip agonizing. It's not uncommon according to history for, for people in, in fact to be torn entirely in half at this point. Hear the sounds of the crowd jeering and, and spitting and, and laughing and hear the cries of Christ as, as the whip comes in and it latches in another time and rips away and there's flesh hanging off of his body. They bring him back after this. All the meanwhile, walking past people who are throwing punches, who the Bible says is, are grabbing his beard and plucking it from his face. Uh, I, I've seen movies where they try to depict this, and I would dare say that they never come close. The book of Isaiah tells us at this point, he doesn't even look like a man. His face pitted and bleeding where they've ripped his beard out. His, his flesh across his midsection, across his torso, hanging from his body. Then to take the mockery a step further, they put a robe on him. You call yourself a king, we'll dress you like a king. They put a, a robe on his body and make a crown of thorns. Now don't be mistaken into thinking that these thorns are like something that, that would come on a rose bush. No, these are thorns. Thorns in the Middle East that are six, eight, sometimes nine inches long and, and strong as a nail. And they would take these and weave them into a crown. And they put them on the head of our Savior. And they give him a rod and stand him there and say, look at, look at him, look at the king. One of the men takes the rod and, and smashes like a bat the, the crown of thorns on his head. Thorns so long and hard that they would enter his scalp and, and come out later having scraped against his skull the blood running down his face. They take Jesus and take him on the path called the Via Della Rosa. The way to a place called Golgotha. Translated the place of the skull. At this point, Jesus Christ, a, a torn up, doesn't even look like a human being, perfect individual, is on his way to the cross. They get up there the way that they would go about installing the crosses. They would lay it down. It's a, it's a large, very heavy piece of wood. They would lay the, the individual down 
and, and hammer nails through the hands and through the feet. And then they would take a few men and, and raise this up. And there's a, a hole in the ground where they would then drop the cross. And, and with the drop, the bones would disjoint in your elbows and in your shoulders. And you can almost hear the cry as you picture our Savior lifted up from the earth suspended between the sky and the, the ground on the cross. They're bleeding. And I think of that verse where Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. They would sit there on the cross, obviously already in extreme agony. Some people would not make it alive this far. And with all you could, with with disjointed bones, you would have to push and pull against those nails to get your, your diaphragm up enough to even be able to breathe. I like a song sometimes Andrea sings it for us that says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. You'll have to forgive me this morning for getting kind of emotional in this, but as you really look at the biblical and historical account, the fact that Jesus Christ took all of this, and I believe hanging on that cross, looks down through the future and sees me and my need. That's the suffering of the cross. The Bible records next the sayings of the cross. I want to look at the seven things that we know that Jesus Christ said while he was on the cross. The first one is, is as this process is taking place, Jesus Christ is saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Greek in this, in this situation would actually suggest that this is something that Jesus said over and over and over again. So as Jesus was taking the nail to the hand and, and the, the Roman soldiers are laughing and mocking and the, the people have gathered around and they're spitting. They've got him stripped and exposed. He's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Continually, as he's being punched in the face and people are saying, if you're the son of God, tell us who it was that hit you. He's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I imagine this had to be different for these Roman centurions as most people I would imagine are, are fighting and, and trying to get away and, and moving and being difficult. And here you've got the Savior, a perfect man, laying down his life. Well, he's not fighting like the rest of them. He's not scurrying to get away. He's not swearing back. He's not cursing these individuals. He's laying down his life. He looks then and says, woman, behold thy son. Behold thy mother. He wants to make sure that his mother is taken care of after he's gone. Then he's hanging there, if you'll remember, next to two others. Two thieves. Two people who deserved to be there on a cross like you and I would. And as he hangs there between the two thieves, a conversation begins to take place. One begins to then mock Jesus in the middle. Right? If I'm going down, I may as well make fun of the guys who are making, uh, who are going down here with me in the middle of this. But one Savior, or one, one of the thieves turns to the Savior and says, this guy is definitely the Son of God. There's something different about him. He says, I want you to remember me. And if you remember, the Savior says, today you will be with me in paradise. And the reason I like this is because uh, Jesus made a guarantee, a promise to that thief there. The thief had no time to do a rosary. There was no time for the thief to, to go and get baptized or, or to publicly announce his salvation or to go join a church or, or begin to give to a ministry or knock on a single door. I guess the thief must have just been saved by grace through faith. Then you see Jesus in his next statement utters these two words. I thirst. And listen, the Bible would suggest at the time that Jesus says, I thirst, a darkness begins to come in. 
Now, this is not Jesus talking about physical thirst. I want you to think about this with me. The last time Jesus talked about a cup was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he was there, the Bible says he was praying and he was praying to the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I believe with all of my heart, the cup that Jesus is talking about is what the Old Testament would call the cup of God's indignation or the cup of God's wrath. The fact that the wrath of God for the sin of you and I was going to be poured out. In fact, Jesus Christ knew how big of a deal it was, how how overwhelming this was to the point that he was so stressed that he was sweating drops of blood. I believe this moment on the cross where Jesus says, I thirst. It's a moment that the darkness begins to come in and he's fulfilling the prophecy of drinking the cup of God's wrath. And I want to just stop and, and consider for a moment this idea. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 says that he made him, God the Father made Jesus the Son who knew no sin to be sin for us. So I I want you to stop and consider, everybody who's, who's watching this Easter morning, every sin that you or I have ever committed at this point is placed on Jesus Christ. Listen, the things that that we hope nobody ever knows about, the stories of of our past that we don't ever want anyone to find out, the things that are embarrassing or, or the things that we struggle with now today, all of these things are, are placed on Him. I'm talking about these, these sins of, of murder and, and lying and gossip and things of, of adultery. And I'm talking about every sin known to man. You think, man, there is, there is some stuff that is so bad. Jesus Christ takes it on. And listen, the darkness rolls in. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Taking on the sin of all mankind is is too much for God the Father to look at. And for the first and only time, there's a separation in that trinity as God turns his back on Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, bearing your sin And my sin hangs on a cross. I think of that song, Behold a man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. Listen, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. We are very uh, bad at at looking at other people's sin. Don't we do that? Don't we justify our own and look at everybody else's? Don't we look and say, I mean, I can't believe somebody would do that. I can't believe somebody would say that. I can't believe somebody would go there or, or, or get involved in something like that while we justify our own. All of it on Jesus Christ's shoulders at that point, hanging from that tree. There's been a separation between him and the Father. Then Jesus utters these three words in the English. It is finished. Now listen, Jesus has has just taken literal hell on the cross. Separation from God. And he uses these words, it is finished. Listen, in in the Greek, this is one individual word, and it is this word called tetelestai. If you look into this word, I encourage you to maybe search it out on your on your phone after we're done this morning. This, this word tetelestai in the Greek would mean several things. In fact, it is often written on receipts of individuals when they've paid a bill in full. <coughs> tetelestai, excuse me. A criminal who is uh, serving a sentence would have a sign outside of his his cell, and it would list what he has to pay in time. 
And when his sentence was fulfilled, they would put that word, <coughs> to telestai. The, the payment has been made. Not only that, during a time of war, if you would think with me and imagine the Greek warriors are, are getting ready to go into battle and women and children are waiting back behind and as they go off to battle, they would send a messenger with them. The messenger would go and stay afar off from the battle and, and watch the battle take place. And as the battle would, would rage and go back and forth, he would watch. And as soon as the Greeks had come up with a victory beyond what the enemy could come back from, he would run back shouting out one word, Tetelestai. Tetelestai. The victory is won. The enemy is defeated. We have accomplished the mission. So listen to me. Jesus Christ does not bow his head in defeat and shame and say, it is finished. This is a victory cry. Then Jesus, the Bible says, says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit and bows his head. This is the moment, by the way, that Jesus chose to die. Jesus was not murdered. He laid his life down. Jesus, as the Son of God, chose to die in this moment. Now imagine being these disciples of these women again. This is what you've just seen. Jesus has been beaten. Look, he's told you he's a king. You think he's setting up an earthly kingdom. He's going to free you from the Romans and, and take over. And they just killed him. Do you remember Peter in the garden was fired up? He was so fired up that he pulled a sword and tried to cut a man's head off and missed and cut his ear off, right? Jesus at that point had not been arrested just yet. And, and Peter's thinking, let's do this. Let's take them all. As soon as Jesus is arrested, he's being taken around. Peter's not as confident, right? He's going, man, I, I don't know him. Three times. I told you, I don't know who he is. Everything in their mind that they have believed is, is falling apart. And so listen, a man, a rich man by the name of Joseph uh, comes along with a man who you've heard about in the book of John chapter number three. Uh, you'll find out shows up again later in the Bible by the name of Nicodemus. And these two come and take Jesus and they put him in Joseph's tomb. Now there's a lot of confusion and a lot of questioning by the leaders at the time. What are we going to do? Because this guy's got a bit of a following. They put some guards out there. But I want you to think about the reality that for three days, these people are crying. Mary, the mother of Jesus, watched this happen to her son. The disciples who, who love him and have spent time with him ministering and, and serving and, and learning from him have, have just watched his life been taken from him as it looks. And he's dead. I would imagine they've been laying low, hiding, mourning, and grieving. It's been three days. Three long, agonizing, grief-filled days since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The disciples are distraught and discouraged. Everything they had anticipated the last few years is gone as their proclaimed king lays in a tomb. Satan and the demons of hell are celebrating as though they've won against God's eternal plan and put Jesus Christ forever in the grave in the cold, firm grip of death itself. And he's been dead for three days. But at the grave, something's beginning to happen. Death is losing its grip on the Savior. Heaven's army, I imagine, stands at attention in anticipation of the moment that the stone rolls away and and Jesus steps out of the darkness and angels begin to sing because the dawning of grace is finally here. I'd imagine that Satan screams out, how could this happen? In his hands are the keys of death and hell and the grave, none of them too strong for Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you today that this changes everything. 
There are people listening this morning who have never heard this said directly to them. And that is that Jesus Christ went through this for you. He experienced the beating, the mockery, the death for you. That that sin he bore was yours. So a couple of things this morning, quickly by way of application. I want to encourage you. Number one, if you have never accepted this gift of salvation, would you do that today? Today, would you call upon the name of the Lord? And and you can tell me as I've heard people say, well, Nick, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the things I've been involved in. You don't know my story or my past. All of it, all of it paid for by Jesus Christ. I want to look real quick by way of application here. Chapter number 28, verse number six. The angel tells these, these ladies to do two things. He says, come and see. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. Hey, visit the empty tomb. Remember the resurrected Savior. We serve a risen Savior. You know, all over the world today, people are dying to hear some good news. Right? They're they're checking CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, ABC News, everything that they can. Just give me some good news today. The world is so uncertain. We're living in weird times and, and there's all of these reports and there's different deaths and markets are going crazy and, and everybody is uncertain. Everybody wants some good news. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ died, was buried and rose again for you. Come see the place where the Lord lay. If you are an unbeliever, today's the day to believe. If you are a believer, today's the day to remember what he did for us. But it doesn't end there. He says, come and see the place where the Lord lay. And then the angel says, and go quickly and tell. Come see, take part in the resurrection of Jesus Christ with us. But after that, go and tell somebody. The world is craving some good news today. Will you share it? Will you share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Listen, the Bible says, greater love, the name of our series, greater love hath no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ died for you so that you could have eternal life. So I just ask you this morning, as we celebrate Easter Sunday, can you truly celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Have you experienced the resurrection? I'm not talking about a weird, uh, you know, a uh, weird experience. I'm talking about, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? It's very simple. The book of Romans tells us all you have to do is believe, call on the name of the Lord to be saved. I want to encourage you this morning. If you say, I want to talk more about that. I want to know more about that. Please message our church, call our church, message me. I'd be happy to talk to you. If if you're sitting here in your Uh, living room there today, and you're thinking, man, I have been part of this resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have a relationship. I've been here to come and see. Man, I want to go and tell. I want to encourage you to do that. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Calvary. God, thank you that you loved us enough that when there was no way for us to get to you, you came to us and you made a way. God, I pray for anybody who's listening right now who is not a believer, who has never accepted the Lord as their Savior. God, that they would pray in their heart to you and admit that they believe that you died and rose for them. God, that they would ask you to save them now. God, and we know through your word that you promise you'll do it. God, for the believers out there, I ask that you would please, Lord, stir us up. God, in a world that's craving good news, we've got the best news. Help us to share it. Lord, as our families continue today to celebrate Easter, God, give us a good time. But Lord, I I ask that you'd help us to remember what this is all about. Thank you for the resurrection. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching, for joining us. Hope that you'll be with us next week, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock on the Crossway Church page. Have a good Easter. I miss y'all.
God bless.